Good morning. We welcome you to the worship service this morning. We're happy you could be with us, and especially welcome those who are visitors with us. And may this time of worship be a blessing to each one of you. The words taken from Psalm 67, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among the nations. Let the people praise you, O God, let all the people praise you. O let all the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Let the people praise you, O God, let all the people praise you. Father, we ask your blessing on us today. We ask that our hearts and minds be renewed. We pray that as we hear the words spoken today, we will be inspired to see your character in a much richer way. We ask your blessing on this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 70, Praise Ye the Father.
We're happy to have you with us today. As you can see in the bulletin, our services today are focused around this seminar by Dr. Jennings. And uh, many of you uh, have been blessed by his materials in the past. And a number of you are visiting today. Some as far, have come as far away as Sacramento and San Diego. I see other guests here as well. We welcome you and are happy to have you. Some of you will want, many of you will want to take home materials. Because Come and Ministry, uh, Come and Reason, excuse me, is a ministry, these uh, materials that Dr. Jennings has uh, prepared are available uh, to you to take home. Uh, we're only asking a donation to simply cover the cost of printing and, and uh, uh, shipping. There's nobody, neither Dr. Jennings or us are making any money on this. It's just that providing you an opportunity to take this material home so you can study and, and use it yourself. These will be available uh, after, after the services today, and we invite you to take advantage of that. Again, thank you for coming, and God bless you. And note, take note of the meetings after, uh, in the afternoon. If you're a, a guest here today, and anyone is welcome to come to the potluck, and then after the potluck, we'll meet again here in the afternoon. Thank you. Boys and girls, come forward quickly for the children's story. And while they're coming, we'd like to invite you, the, the, the rest of you, to stand to your feet, reach around, and welcome those around you and greet each other to church today. Good morning, boys and girls. 
How many of you have ever been asked by a teacher or your parents to give some great news to somebody? And what was that news? Have, has, have any of you ever given good news to somebody? Can you think of something? I got A plus on a science test. Very good. Anybody else have great news to tell somebody? Do you? Anybody? Well, I just want to show you different ways of being a good messenger of how to do that. What is the purpose of a bell? Can somebody tell me the purpose of a bell? It rings. It rings. What else? What else does a bell do? Um, it sounds. It sounds. It makes noise, right? Well, I have two different bells. I have this bell, which is big and heavy. Get ready. I'm going to try to make it make a noise. Nothing. And then I have this smaller bell, and let's see what it does. This one makes a lot of noise, and they can probably hear it from way up there. Well, you know what? That's the purpose of a bell, is to make noise and to ring, just like God made a purpose for, the each, for each of us. And He wants each of us to be like this bell, no, he wants us to be good ambassadors and spokespeople for God, to let other people know about his love so that everyone will know about it. So, boys and girls, I want you to decide if you're going to be like this bell or this bell. Yeah. Can everyone, each of you, make a ding dong noise for me right now? What kind of what kind of uh, noise does a bell make? Ding dong. Louder! I can't hear you. Ding dong. All right, let's all be ding dongs. All right, uh, there is no children's church today. You can go back to your seats. Thank you. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite the deacons, please, to come forward as we take today's offering. So in 2 Corinthians, it says, Each one must give as they have decided in their heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves what? A cheerful giver. Exactly. You guys know your Bibles. Well done. So today, no one's going to force you to give. Uh, we don't want you to give out of compulsion. We want you to give freely and gladly and with joy. And just so you know, today the money you give will go to the church budget. So it's not going to some abstract institution. The money you, go, the, the money you give today, uh, in reality, goes to all the things that help this church to function. Uh, if your, your generous offerings will go to things like the children, uh, the youth, uh, the small groups, families, and I indeed for all the things like behind me, like all this wonderful music as well. So please know that your generous giving really is what helps this church function. So I encourage you all today to give generously and gladly, knowing that God will greatly bless you in return for doing so.
Father, you have given us so much, and now we give freely back to you, and we are happy and joyful to do so. So take these offerings and put them to good use for the furthering of your kingdom on this earth. We ask in your name. Amen. Please take a seat.
Good morning, church. Welcome. Uh, those who have a, a special request, not you know, okay. I will. We we'll invite you to uh, kneel if you are able to kneel uh, at this moment. Father God, we come to worship you on this Sabbath day to give you praise and thanks for all the blessings you have given us during the, this past week. Father, we are so grateful that we live in a country where we can worship you freely and thank you for the sacrifice that your son did in order for us to have this freedom. Father, we ask that you bless those who are here and those who are, could not be here due to illness or other commitments. And for those who are here, special uh, requests. We have said, Lord, wherever two or more have gathered and in, the, in thy name, you are here also. We are here gathered in your name Please hear our prayers and petitions. Please bless our community, our church, and more importantly, help us to prepare to receive your message this morning through the word of Jim Jennings. And as we leave from this year present, we ask that the blessings we have received this Sabbath stay with us the rest of the week. As we celebrate Thanksgiving in this upcoming week, Help us to count our blessing and as to and to give thankful to, for all the blessings you have given us uh, through the entire year, as well as including the ultimate freedom we have because of your Son Jesus Christ. We ask for your forgiveness as we give us your blessing, as we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Becoming a spokesperson for God. Why become a spokesperson for God? When you look around the world today and you see what's happening in the world, does your heart ache? Does it just make you sick? Imagine what it must be like for God to see all of the suffering, the exploitation, the human trafficking, the, the, the mean-spiritedness going on in the world. Jesus said at the end of time, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Could this mean that we have a role to play? Do we have a role in taking the gospel to the world? Revelation 7 suggests that we do. It tells that an angel comes from heaven telling the angels that the four holding back the four winds of strife from the four corners of the earth. It says, hold, 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 until an event happens. They're holding until an event, until the servants of God are sealed into their foreheads. And in the Bible, the servants of God are always his prophets. And the Bible prophets are not simply prognosticators, fortune tellers, future tellers. No, the prophets were primarily, first and foremost, people who came with a message from God for the people of that time. They're his spokespersons. We got a message. God says, Jonah to Nineveh, prophet. God is waking, waiting for a group to be settled, to be sealed in the forehead. The servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. A group of people at the end of time who are able to speak for him, to take a message from him to the world. And then after this group is sealed, then the four winds are loosed. 
And why would the four winds lose? Tragic events begin happening because the world now, people are so caught up into the mundane routines of life, just trying to put food on the table. Or they're caught up in entertainment. Or they're caught up in sports. They're just caught up in the world. They don't even think of eternal things. So the four winds are loose. So people go, what's happening in the world? What's going on? And when they ask the question, God will have his spokesperson to be able to stand up and say, here's what's happening. And from their witness, it says in Revelation, they tell the truth, and from their witness, a great multitude from every nation, tribe, kindred, and people are saved. We are his witnesses. He's waiting for a people to be able to tell the final message of mercy to a world who needs to hear it. So when you think about that, what is the essential truth that we must settle into, that we can't be shaken from, in order to be a spokesperson for God? Is it the day of worship? We have to know what the Bible Sabbath is. That's the core thing. If you don't, that's the one. Once you know that, then you're ready. Mortality or immortality of the soul, that's the one we have to know. Method of baptism. The right, who are the ten horns of, of Revelation? We have to know the right interpretation of, script, of, of prophecy. Understanding about God's temple and the sanctuary. Pre or post tribulation rapture. We have to know what the truth is on that. I'm going to suggest to you 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 tells us that though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we use, they're not worldly. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. You'll notice what we demolish. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought to Jesus Christ. I'm going to suggest to you the core central thing you have to know is God. Life eternal, they might know you, the only true God. The essential truth is the truth about God, his character, his methods of love in the setting of the cosmic conflict. Why? Why is that the central truth? Where did sin begin? In heaven. With whom? With Lucifer. You were the anointed, the guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Over what did Lucifer start his rebellion? How did that happen? What did Lucifer do to get a third of sinless beings, sinless angels who could talk to God face to face, what did Lucifer do to get a third of them to rebel? What did he say? What issue did he raise? What was the lie? Did he tempt them to chip up the streets of gold and sell them on the black market? Look at all this gold around here. We made a lot of money. Did he tempt them with drugs or alcohol? Did he suggest he was actually stronger than God and he challenged God to an arm wrestling contest? I want you to imagine you're an angel in heaven. Sinless. No, perfect. And from the moment of your creation, as you awake to consciousness, you're privileged to meet the Father, Son, and Spirit, but you also meet another being who was created before you named Lucifer. Lucifer is an angel. You're an angel. You have a lot in common. And over the millions and eons of years of time, you've come to love Lucifer as a close friend. He's come from God's presence on many occasions and told you things that have enlightened and thrilled your soul. You've sung in the choir with him. You've traveled the universe with him. He's been to your house for dinner. You've been to his. And one day Lucifer comes from God's presence and begins to say some things to you you've never considered before. You've got a strange feeling. Uh, uh, little chills go up your spine. You've never had this emotion before. He's saying things to you about God that, that make you feel something called uncertainty and fear that you've never had. If, if you were this angel in heaven, what, what might you do? Might you want to go to God for clarity? And so you go to God. God, Lucifer is saying some things about you. I love you, God, but I love Lucifer too. Well, I'm glad you love us both. Love is good, but... Lucifer's saying some things just aren't right. I knew it had to be a misunderstanding. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. You run, find Lucifer. Lucifer, I just had a call with God. He's saying what you're saying isn't right. Lucifer cries, tears coming down his face. And I know, I know, that's the problem. God's lying. 
you were that angel, what would you do? How would you know? Now you're saying, oh, that's a neat scenario, but what was the issue? What was he suggesting that caused the confusion? From the opening of the great controversy, it has been Satan's purpose to misrepresent God's character. This is the core issue. Misrepresents God's character. And to excite rebellion against his law. How? How did he do that? Well, what do you understand God's character to be? How do you understand God's character? Well, God is love. God is not forgiveness, even though he's forgiving. God is not power, even though he's all-powerful. God is not knowledge, even though he's all-knowing. All of these attributes are manifestations of his true character. God is love. And how would God, who is love, build or construct reality? In harmony or out of harmony with himself? Would it not be in harmony with himself? Yes. Then how do you understand God's law? The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. Or Jesus sums it all up, that all, that all law hangs on love for God and love for your, your fellow man. How does love function? It's operational. It's functional. The Bible says love is not self-seeking. It's other-centered. It's giving. It's beneficent. That's why it says those who pursue righteousness and love find life. Why is it they find life? Because that is the way God built life. It would be like somebody in the desert who pursues water finds life because water is one of the things you have to have to live. It's what we're designed for. Examples. Respiration. Every breath you take. I gave this one twice already. Every breath you take, you give away carbon dioxide, and the plants give oxygen back to you. And never any circle of giving. You're giving away your carbon But how about if you want to hoard your carbon dioxide, and you selfishly hoard it with a plastic bag over your head? See, the wages of doing that is death. And see, here's one of those secrets. When was the last time you got up in the morning and said, man, I've got to breathe today? See, you don't even think about breathing. It's easy unless you're really sick. If you're really, really sick, then breathing becomes hard. You might even need an artificial respirator to help you breathe. See, when God, had his way, when God has his way in our life, when he finishes what he wants to finish in your heart and my heart, it would be as easy for us to love others as it is to breathe. That's his design. This is design law. It's not a rule. It's just how life was designed to build, to work. So Leo Tolstoy wrote, uh, love is life. Everything that I understand, I understand only because I love. Everything is, everything exists only because I love. Everything is united by it, alone. Love. Well, maybe Tolstoy, you might not think he might not be too, too much of an authoritarian source on this, somebody we shouldn't rely on. Here's somebody some people value. This is Ellen White out of Christ's Object Lessons. In living for self, he has rejected that divine love which would have flowed out in mercy to his fellow man. Thus, he has rejected life. For God is love, and love is life. Okay, I believe, I believe Tolstoy now. So how could Satan, God is love, he built his universe to operate on love, it's the principles upon which life is physically even constructed, the principles of giving. How can Satan attack God and his law of love? How could he do that? By alleging God's laws are not the laws the fabric of the universe are built upon. Instead, his laws are merely a system of rules, like we make up, that he threatens to punish you by if you break them. He just determines willy-nilly, I'm going to do this rule, I'm in charge, do it or else. That's what he did. But what issue did he raise to suggest, what evidence did he point to that this is how God's law works? He attacked the position of Jesus. You know, Jesus is fully God. This is my view. He is preexistent, possessing life in himself, life that he is unborrowed, underived from another source. He is one with the Father from all eternity. And all things were created by him that were created. You know the text, John 1, uh, Colossians chapter 1. He is the creator God. Jesus is. Now God is infinite. And thus it says in 1 Timothy that God lives in unapproachable light. Unapproachable by whom? 
Think that through. He lives an unapproachable light. Unapproachable by whom? By created beings. Why? Why can't we approach it? Can finite beings with finite capacities and finite abilities enter infinity and live? Can we? No, we, we're finite. We don't have the capacity. We cannot enter infinity. That's why it's unapproachable to us. It's beyond our abilities. So if God wants the closest intimacy with his creation, and he lives in unapproachable light, he's an infinite being, and he wants close intimacy with his creation, which are finite beings, what must happen? A member of the Godhead has to leave infinity and step into a linear existence. Does everybody follow that? Because we can't enter infinity. The member of the Godhead who represents the Godhead in physical form to his creation is Jesus. He's the member of that Godhead. Everybody with me? So what, the question is, what form, what physical form did Jesus present himself in? What physical form did he take prior to his incarnation on earth as a human being? What physical form? When he, when he left infinity to interact with his creation closely and intimately, what physical form? Well, notice I will give you scripture. Um, it says, there the, this is Moses talking to God at the bush. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of the fire within the bush. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses, Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals, for the place you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Who is this God? The angel of the Lord. That's also, it's in Exodus chapter 3 and Acts chapter 7, both. Or Jesus speaking uh, says, I tell you the truth, the time is coming and now comes and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Whose voice is it that raises the dead? Jesus' voice, right? Okay. So, whose voice? Then we read in Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ rise first. Whose voice is that? That's the voice of Jesus. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare bring slanderous accusations against him, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. He basically said, devil, you have no power here. Talk to the hand. Not listening. But who is raising Moses from the dead? That's Jesus, the archangel, Michael. So what issue did Lucifer twist that some of the angels tripped over to believe his lies? Well, who was Michael? That was Christ in his pre-incarnate state. In what form did he appear? The form of an angel, but, but let me say this very clearly. He is fully God. He is not an angel. Okay? Don't confuse this with other, other religious groups out there. He is not an angel. He is only appearing in the form of an angel to interact with his creation. Who appeared to be the same as Michael. On the outside, Lucifer. Did you know they both shared a name? They shared the name Lightbearer, or Lucifer. In 1 Peter 1.19, referring to Jesus, it says, until the day star, or the bright and morning star dawns. That bright and morning star, day star, refers to Jesus. The Greek is phosphorus, from where we get the name phosphorus, the bright shining metal. Translated into the Latin version of the Bible, that word is translated as Lucifer. Jesus is the Lucifer. Because Lucifer actually means light bearer. That's what the word literally means. Jesus is, and who does the Bible say is the light that lightens all men? Jesus is the light bearer. But the created being, Lucifer, was created to be a light bearer. That's what he was to be. So what did Lucifer allege? This is origin of Alexandria. He who was Lucifer and who arose in heaven, he who was without sin from the day of his birth and who was among the cherubim, was able to fall with respect to the kindness of the Son of God before he could be bound by chains of love. In other words, he became jealous over Christ. 
Origen saw this. Ellen White wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, In coveting the glory with which the infinite Father had invested in his Son, the Prince of Angels aspired to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. Or, this, to dispute the supremacy of the Son of God, thus impeaching the wisdom and love of the Creator, had become the purpose of this Prince of Angels. So what did Lucifer allege? He alleged Michael and I are the same. He's a covering cherub, I'm a covering cherub. We're both covering cherubs. There's no difference between us. We're the same. But God has chosen Michael over Lucifer arbitrarily. Not because of some design, not because of some inherent difference between us, simply because he prefers him over me, and he allows him to go into councils that I can't enter. This is unfair. This is arbitrary. It's just a system of rules. He's made a rule that I'm not allowed to go, but he didn't put that rule for Michael. God's law is not love, not protocols of reality. It's simply a system of rules. God is selfish, and he won't share. He pretends to give us freedom, but watch out, he really doesn't. And now we've got a new ruler put over us to restrict us and restrict our liberties. If you step out of line, God's going to use his power to punish. You better watch out. So when this war began in heaven and Lucifer is making his allegations, how did God respond? Satan and his angels were cast out. There's a war in heaven. The war, by the way, in the Greek New Testament is polemo, from where we get polemic. This was a war of words. It was not a war of physical might. It was a war of ideas. It was just like I read to you earlier. Uh, uh, the knowledge of God was being obstructed by distortions from Lucifer. So they, they battled, and then they're cast out, not as punishment, but they're put on the stage. Okay, Satan, okay, Lucifer, you say you're equal to Christ? Let's just examine that. Let everyone watch and observe. Let everyone learn from reality itself because you don't have to make a declaration when it's inherently different and we can demonstrate it. The earth was a dark void in the Milky Way. Deep black abyss. And Satan couldn't do a thing with it. You claim equality with Christ? You claim equality with Michael and Jesus? Okay, there you go. Do something with that. Show us what you can do. Nothing. And then Jesus comes along and says, let there be light. Let the firmament come forth. Let the land come forth. And on day six, he says, let us make man in our image. Let them be fruitful and multiply. And what does it say about God? That in a con think, think about what, what God is trying to establish here. Here we have these new intelligent beings created in the image of God, and as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come into unity of love, they give of themselves and create new intelligent life. Here we have a new creation that have the ability to come into the unity of love and give of themselves and create life in their image. And if Adam and Eve would have been fruitful and multiply in a sinless world, why would they have brought children into the world? Would they have brought children into the world to enslave, to abuse, to lord over, to dominate? Or would Adam and Eve, if they had children in this endless world, have given constantly of themselves for the health and welfare of their children? And the universe would have looked in and said, oh, God didn't create us to serve him and wait on him. He is the source of all that's good. He's constantly pouring his blessings out on us. This was revelation. Why didn't Adam and Eve, when they were planning how they were going to organize their garden, invite the lions and elephants and other animals into those strategy sessions? Was it because they were selfish and didn't care about the lions and the elephants? Or was it because the lions and the elephants didn't have anything to contribute to a conversation between Adam and Eve? Now, I'll ask you this. What's the bigger gap? The gap between you and an elephant? The gap between you and a dog? Or the gap between you and God? What's the bigger gap? The man and God. That's exactly right. It's a much bigger gap. It's, he's infinite. We're finite. So we learn Lucifer was not left out of the councils of heaven because God was restrictive. But as exalted as Lucifer was, he's still a finite being. He cannot enter infinity. Christ, an infinite being, can enter infinity. This was not a restriction. It was inherent in his ability. And we, we learn that by looking at this new creation. 
Why was Jesus the member of the Godhead who created? Because the Father couldn't have done it or the Spirit couldn't have? No. Whom did Satan allege equality with? Jesus. So Jesus demonstrates. You're not equal. You're a created being. I'm the creator. All things were made by him and through him. And while without him, nothing was made that has been made. So we're revealing. God's not declaring. God is revealing. Giving evidence. How did Satan respond? He tells more lies about God. Hey, universe, I never said God wasn't powerful. You never heard that from me. I said he's not good. He's just flexing his muscles. He's trying to intimidate. And think about the power that was displayed at Creation Week. We can take a few grams of matter. We turn that matter back into energy here on Earth. We call that a nuclear explosion. Just a few grams. How much energy to create the planet, to create the sun, to create their solar system? This was a display of power like never seen. This is amazing. And so they, I never said he wasn't powerful. He's not good. And he's flexing his muscles. He's trying to intimidate. He's telling you to get in line or else I can remove you. And look, I can replace you with new intelligent beings anytime I want. How did God respond to that? Universe, you've heard the allegations. You've seen the evidence that we've just created. And remember, the whole planet was created with other-centered love. All the law of love built into every aspect of nature. The whole design revealing God's methods. You've seen the evidence we've just given us. Now, universe, take 24 hours aside. I rest my case. Think it through for yourself. No coercion. No intimidation. No pressure. No compelling power. Truth has been presented to you in love. Now I leave you free. Come to your own conclusion. When was it, what does it think about it? What does it say about God that he created the Sabbath in this context? What's the context when the Sabbath is created? There's war. Satan is alleging that God is untrustworthy, that God should not be followed. He's trying to turn hearts and minds away from loyalty to God. So the purpose of the Sabbath... What does it say about God that rather than using power to make every knee bow, he instead creates a day for free thinking? It's amazing. So the Sabbath is the embodiment of God's design laws. Truth, we're presented in love, leaving people free. If you want to be a Sabbath observer, you have to have those methods written on your heart. You've got to be a person who presents truth in love and leaves people free. If you're willing to do like Saul of Tarsus, and imprison people who don't keep your Sabbath, you're not a Sabbath keeper. Even if you're doing it from Friday Saturday, sunset to Saturday sunset. The Sabbath itself is evidence. A weekly signpost of God's character of love. And the freedoms we have with him. It's, it's proof that Satan lied. You see, days one through six of creation week, we learn that God has power. Day seven we see the character of the one who wields the power. Truth presented in love, leaving free, no coercion. See, if God were coercive, willing to force people in line, there wouldn't be a Sabbath. God created Adam, Eve, Eden, the Sabbath, and something else was also placed in the garden. What was placed in the garden? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. What was the purpose of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? To test, to protect, to provide opportunity for them to mature and grow. The key is understanding God's law. Do you understand God's law as the protocols by which reality are built, or just a system of rules to test people by, and if you break the rules, you get punished? How do you understand it? Arbitrary rules, impose law, then you see the tree as a test of their obedience, and they have to make a choice who they're going to be loyal to. And if they make the bad choice, then they get punished. If you understand design law, then you understand that the tree was put there for two purposes. One, and primary purpose, was to help them develop a mature character. You understand character cannot be created. God creates sinless beings. Those beings develop their character by the choices they make. Adam and Eve had to be presented with the options, and they had to decide who they were going to trust, who they were going to believe, which methods they preferred. And in so doing, they either develop a righteous and holy character or they develop a fear-based survival character, which is what they chose. Did they trust God or not? And it was put there secondarily as a protection. 
Satan could only approach them at the tree. Think about it. The entire planet Earth, they could travel. The entire planet, and free of any temptation, the only place Satan could approach them was at the tree. Wouldn't that be cool? So this is a historic view from the Seventh-day Adventist Church from Ellen White in the book Story of Redemption. God would not permit Satan to follow the holy pair with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God might have created man without the power to transgress his law. He might have withheld the hand of Adam from touching the forbidden fruit. But in that case, man would have been not a free moral agent, but a mere automaton, in other words, a robot. Without freedom of choice, his obedience would not have been voluntary, but forced. Their character there could have been no development of character. It would have been unworthy of man as an intelligent being and would have sustained Satan's charges of God's arbitrary rule. Ellen White, Conflict and Courage, page 33. It was put there so they could grow and develop and advance. For their protection and development, that's why the tree was there. Not as a test, not as a trip, and trip them up. What did God tell them about the tree? And God told them something about the tree. In the day you eat from it, dying you will die. Which basically means in the day you eat from the tree, you'll be deviating from my design for life. And when you deviate from my design for life, you're going to deteriorate, decay, and die. Because you will be out of harmony with me, and I'm the sustaining source of all life. And out of harmony with me, life deteriorates and dies. How did Satan respond? He tells more lies about God and God's design law. He says, did God say in the day you eat you'll die? Oh, no, 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 no. You won't die if you eat. You'll become like God. In other words, Satan is saying, there is nothing inherently wrong with deviating from God's design law. You won't deteriorate. You won't die. God is lying to you. See the difference in the two laws. If you're not sure what I'm saying here, the difference between saying if you jump off the Empire State Building, you're going to die, and somebody coming along and saying if you go 36 in a 35 zone, there's really no, nothing wrong with that. You won't die. So you're going 36 in a 35 zone, there really isn't significantly anything wrong with that. You won't die from that. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Satan is saying God's law is like that. It's like going 36 in a 35. Nothing wrong with it. No harm. God's saying, my law is like the law of gravity. If you are not in harmony with it, you can't live. You're going to die. So I want you to believe you're in a loving, other-centered marriage relationship. You love and trust your spouse. Your spouse loves and trusts you. And somebody else you love and trust, maybe one of your siblings, brother, sister, comes to you with tears in their eyes crying, tells you a lie. They tell you that your spouse has been having an affair. And then they pull out their computer and show pictures they've doctored on their computer and make it appear as if your spouse was somebody else. Now, while it's not true, well, your spouse is loyal and faithful and done no wrong, if you believe the lie, does something inside of you change? Lies believed break the circle of love and trust. And as soon as love and trust are broken, fear and selfishness takes root in the heart. I don't trust you anymore. I think you're with somebody else. I'm afraid you're going to hurt me. I'm afraid you're going to ruin me a disease. I'm afraid you're going to financially ruin me. And then you have to take actions to protect yourself. You're not sleeping with me tonight. You're getting, and I'm getting out of here. I'm getting the money before you do. This is survival-driven stuff. These are acts of sin now. Notice we're three steps down before we have a behavior problem. Lies believe, break the circle of love and trust, broken love and trust, fear and selfishness. Fear and selfishness result in acts of sin. And this is a terminal condition. Without remedy, this results in death. Again, another historic quote. This is Review and Herald, uh, January 9, 1886. Eve believed the words of Satan, and the belief of that falsehood in regard to God's character changed the condition and character of both herself and husband. They were changed from good and obedient children to transgressors. Most people under the imposed law construct say it wasn't sin until they took the fruit. It was the behavior. It was the act. It was the deed. It's the doing the wrong. It's legal. It's not. The taking the fruit was the evidence of the corruption in the heart. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, you commit adultery, bad deed, you commit sin. I say if you lust in your heart. 
The deeds are an evidence of the condition of the heart, and the heart was changed because they no longer trusted God because they believed lies about him and how he runs his universe. That's the corruption. How did God respond? Genesis 3, the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head, and the serpent will bruise his heel. A Savior, a Messiah is promised to come and provide remedy, to redeem, to save them from this terminal condition. How did Satan respond? What strategy could Satan use to prevent Christ from coming to earth to save man? And I talked about this in our previous lecture. Would, would God have baby Jesus born to a woman like Jezebel? No. Would he force a woman against her will to be the mother of Jesus? No. And so Satan begins to stir up the world to harden hearts, to destroy the character of God, to, to permanently obstruct the work of the Spirit. And it says in Genesis 6, how does it describe the world in Genesis 6? They were violent and violent all the time. There was nothing but hatred. And, and of course, there was only one righteous man left in the whole earth at that time. One righteous man. The avenue for the Messiah was almost closed. Only one person still working with God. And so how did God respond? He sends a flood. To punish? No. To keep open avenue so Messiah would come. How did Satan respond? Satan tells more lies about God. See, God will destroy you. God's out to get you. You don't do what he says, he'll punish you. You can't trust it. Just like I said, that's how his law works. You see what he's doing. You can't, you're not going to get to heaven with this guy. You better get your own way to heaven. Start building a tower and we'll go, we'll go ourselves. How did God respond? He confused their languages. Why did he confuse their languages? Was this punishment? No. Satan's the father of so what does confusing languages do? It slows the spread of lies. It was designed to slow Satan's ability to infect the entire world at once with his distortion. Another act of mercy on God's part. And God recruited helpers to help act out the plan of salvation and teach that a Messiah was coming. Abraham and his family. How did Satan respond to this? He targets Abraham's family. He says, oh, now I know that it's only this branch of humanity from where the Savior's going to come. I don't have to harden the whole, whole earth. I only have to destroy this branch, and I will destroy the avenue for Messiah. So he targets them by attacking them, and they become self-centered. They become lustful. They become envious. And 12, 11 brothers, or 10 brothers sell one brother into slavery. And I think Satan caused a famine to try and starve and destroy that family. Now, if you think Satan doesn't have that power, I would encourage you to read Job chapter 1. Satan has the power to affect weather. And so I think he was trying to destroy the family of Abraham. To starve them out. So the Messiah would close. And so, close the avenue. How did God respond? Well, God responds by blessing Joseph. Joseph trusts him. He goes through hard times. But God blesses him. Everywhere he goes, he's, he's working for, for Potiphar. He gets blessed. Potiphar's wife attacks him, you know, but he gets thrown in the dungeon. He gets blessed. Everywhere he goes, he gets blessed. He turns evil to good because of Joseph's trust in him. And ultimately, Joseph is elevated to the second most powerful. You know the story. And the dream is given, and Joseph is there to prepare an avenue, a safe haven, a harbor for the family of Abraham to protect the avenue for the Messiah. How did Satan respond to that? Oh, no. Okay, thwarted there. They're all protected now. Got the grain sort up. They got a, their land of Goshen. This is the fertile land. This is, they got the best. I, I was trying to destroy them, and they get the best. This is not right. What can I do now? Oh, I will incite fear and selfishness in the hearts of, of the Egyptian leadership. In order to destroy this avenue, they became jealous, and they enslaved the people. to crush out the image of God in man and destroy the avenue, hardened hearts. Let's, let's turn them into slaves. Turn them into brute beasts. Let's just turn them into animals that carry and do burdens. How did God respond? He met slaves, level one thinkers. Level one thinkers are, how do you tell what's right and wrong? The most primitive level, reward and punishment. And that's the level of a slave. It's right if I don't get the lash. It's 
It's, it's right to avoid the punishment. It's right to get a reward. Very primitive thinking. He met them where they are, as slaves, with great power over the gods of Egypt. Not over the people of Egypt, over the gods of Egypt, demonstrating that the gods of Egypt were powerless. Because the most primitive level, the ruler establishes his right to rule by displays of might and power. So God says, I did this so you might know that I am the Lord your God. And he frees them. He sends a, he sends a deliverer to freeze them from slavery. Then he also gave them a diagnostic instrument, an MRI of the soul, to help them realize that they were sick in heart and mind. He gave them the written law to expose the sickness and then to lead them back to Christ for healing. Notice the, he gave them two sets of laws. The first law in Exodus chapter 20 was to remind them of design law. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor the manservant, the maidservant, nor the counter, nor the stranger within thy gates. For in six days the Lord, does anybody else know that one? Created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all them in the midst. In other words, he points them to creation, to design law, to how he built reality. This law is a reflection of design law. This is mature thinking. That's what he gave them, first set. And what did they do with it? They began worshiping a golden calf. They were not ready for maturity. They were children. They needed milk. They couldn't handle meat. So that set got crushed, broken. He gave another set. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days. Because why? I am the Lord who brought you out of slavery. I'm powerful. Remember, I'm powerful. He met them where they are. How did Satan respond? He, oh, he incited the fear, the self lust, lust, so forth. How did God respond? He had them grind up the, uh, the golden god and had him drink it. Think that through. You're just worshiping this thing, and now you're drinking it. And when you ingest things, where does the products of digestion come out? You think God was trying to tell them the worth of these gods they were worshiping? They're refuse to be flushed. And then he gave them the second version, reminding them that he's powerful, because that's where they, they needed to be reminded of. And then he tries to move them up the second level. First level is reward and punishment. Second level is the marketplace exchange. You do something for me, and I'll do something back for you. This is the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth mentality. He tried to move them to eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And they tried to respond, okay, well, let's make a deal with the Lord. You say it, we'll do it. You keep your promises, we'll, we'll keep the law, and you, and you bless us. And then God gave them a great theater. We talked about it last night in detail. He gave them costumes, props, and a script to act out his plan to cleanse the spirit temple and restore God's image within man. How did Satan respond to this? He distorted the system so that they came to view that God liked blood sacrifices, and the more blood shed, the more he'd be appeased. And he, he taught them to accept pagan views of God. Baal, this is a picture of Molech, and you know the stories in Molech, uh, some of the kings of Israel would actually, and this is exactly what it was, it was a, it was a cast iron God that uh, they would, it was hollow inside, they would build fires inside it, turning it, the, the metal red hot, and then they would throw their babies on the hands of that red hot metal. That's how they worshipped this God. They began to believe in a God who required blood payment. This is Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, 684. While God had desired to teach men that from his own love comes the gift which reconciles them to himself, the arch enemy of mankind is endeavored to represent God as one who delights in their destruction. Thus the sacrifices and ordinance designed of heaven to reveal divine love have been perverted to serve as a means whereby sinners have vainly hoped to propitiate with gifts and good works the wrath of an offended God. Paganism. This is exactly how they came to view it, and exactly how many Christians today view the purpose of the death of Christ, to propitiate God's wrath so he won't have to kill you for your sin. It's paganism. How did God respond? Well, he sent his spokespersons to tell them their entire understanding of all this was wrong. With what shall I, this is Micah 6, 6 through 8, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come with burnt offerings with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? 
Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You see the, 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 the thought process. You see the thinking here. Well, he's a, rat, he's a God. He's a God who you have to influence. You have to purchase things from. You have to buy things from. You have to give him something because he won't give out of the purpose of his heart. No, he needs appeasement and his propitiation. So if I give, was it oil? Is it rams? It's my firstborn son. I'll give anything, right? This would God, what, what does God say? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. How did Satan respond? He responded with Baal worship. Now what is Baal worship? Let me tell you who Baal was. This is the actual Mesopotamian god, Baal. Baal was the son of El. El was the father. Baal was the sun god. S-O-N, the son of El. You might have heard of El. El Ohim, El Shaddai. He was the son of El. Baal was the god of weather, the god of creation, the god who brought the harvest, the god who brought the rain. Baal, in their pantheon, he fought the great serpent, Leviathan, and he also fought the god of death known as Mot. And in his battle with the god of death, Baal dies and rises again to bring life to the land. This was all true in who Baal was. Now, what was wrong? What is wrong with worshiping God the Son, who is the creator, who controls the weather and brings rain and brings life and brings the harvest, who fights the serpent on our behalf, who fights death and dies for us and rises again to bring us life. What's wrong with worshiping this God? Does it sound eerily close to who you worship? Baal required payment or appeasement to provide blessings. If you didn't offer him something, you got no blessings. You had to offer something to get blessings. Baal became Zeus to the Greeks, the god of thunder, Jupiter to the Romans, the god of thunder, Thor to the Norse people, and Jesus Christ to those Christians who today worship a god who, like Baal, must be propitiated and appeased with the blood of a human sacrifice, lest he torture and kill. That's Baal worship, and most of Christianity is doing it. That's why Micah prophesied, excuse me, Malachi prophesied that before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the prophet Elijah must come again. This is that spokespersons for God. He needs his spokespersons again at the end of time to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the sons back to the fathers. The message of reconciliation, the message of love, not this message of fear and appeasement. How did God respond to, the, to their Baal worship? Hosea 4.17. Ephraim is joined to his idols. Leave him alone. If that's what you've chosen, if you won't listen to all my pleas, all my entreaties, if you won't come back, because there's no coercion, no threat, I surrender you to your choice. He set them free and put them in the care of the God that they chose. And how did Satan respond? Slavery which is what sin always does to the sinner. It enslaves you. And they went into slavery. The Babylonians came when God removed his hand and surrendered them to their Baal worship and distorted God concepts. God said, okay, I'm going to let you go your way. And they went into slavery. How did God respond? He stayed with his faithful few even while they were slaves in Babylon and Persia, protecting them amidst the fires of persecution. And... He prophesied that they would be set free and return to their land to begin representing him again. Artaxerxes sets the people free. How did Satan respond to this? He inspires them to never go into Baal worship again so that they will never ever be uh, let go. And so they become very legal and make a, a rigid adherence to law and add laws upon laws and rules upon rules they became very legal and, and rigorous in their religiosity. How did God respond to their legal, religious... And, and you notice now through the course of time, we're looking at the grand scheme. We're looking at the, at the story of the controversy playing out through human history. When is the first time in human history God's people, the children of Abraham, the ones chosen to be his representatives, the priesthood that was supposed to evangelize the world, when is the first time in history we have a group of people who appear to follow, finally be following the script? It's the time when Christ came. Up until then, they were constantly going after the other gods. 
Now they're keeping the script. Legalistically, but they're following the rules. And so now God sent his son to reveal the truth about God and his law, not to condemn the world. It says in John 3, 17, he did not come to condemn the world, but to heal or to save the world through him. To heal or cure what was wrong with sinners. How did Satan respond to this? Messiah is now on earth. What's his reaction? Hey, let's kill him. Let's inspire Herod to put baby Jesus to death. Let's send the soldiers in. Now all children of two years of age and under, let's, let's kill them. Now, if you believe in the legal view, in that what's needed is the blood payment of a sinless sacrifice in order to pay the legal debt for the sinners who can't pay their legal debt by their own selves, uh, their own life dying, well, this could have been it. We've got sinless Jesus, son of God, born on earth. Herod is trying to kill him. God can allow him to be killed right there as an innocent sacrifice. His blood is shed. Payment is made. We're all good, right? Blood payment was never needed. It was never the problem. So how did God respond to Herod's threat? Had Jesus' family flee to avoid the threat? Satan's next move. When Jesus goes into his ministry, he begins to tempt Jesus with deceptions and inducements. Trying to present himself as an angel of light and trying to induce him with bribes of various kinds. How did Jesus respond? Jesus responds by what I call the integrative evidence-based approach using the three threads of evidence, scripture, science and nature, and how life actually works. And you see that in all of Jesus' teachings. And he goes to break down the barriers by using his power to heal, to love others, to um, treat all people equally, to deliver, to restore. This is what he does with power. He touches lepers. He ate with the so-called sinners. He spoke to prostitutes and Samaritans. He revealed God and God's law of love perfectly. What was Satan's next move? Okay, temptation didn't work. Trickery didn't work. Subtlety didn't work. Deception didn't work. Bribery, well, have all these lands. I'll give them to you. Bribery didn't work. What's the next thing? Coercion. Betrayal by one of your trusted and coercive pressure to save self. Ultimately ending in execution. So the question now is, what did Jesus accomplish? It was a question asked earlier in our first talk, and let's walk through what Jesus accomplished. The imposed law of you, well, he paid the legal penalty. The law was broken. Somebody had to die to pay the penalty. Jesus died to pay the penalty. You can take that legal claim, put it your records in heaven, and God declares you to be righteous even though you're just as wicked as ever. That's the legal view, and it's a lie. Design law, something much more profound happened. He provides the remedy to our condition and restores the creation back to God's design. So let's walk through. Number one, what did Jesus accomplish? He revealed the truth, which exposes Satan as a liar and a fraud, secures the unfallen beings throughout the universe to their trust in him. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Notice, the heavenly beings who did not rebel had lots of unanswered questions. Jesus revealed, and we won't go through all those questions now because I don't have time, but Jesus revealed the truth of who God is, God's methods, God's character, God's law. Satan is exposed as a liar and a fraud. And thus the angelic beings in heaven are solidified in their loyalty to Christ's accomplishments at the cross. Two, he destroys Satan and his power. Hebrews 2.14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death that is the devil. Satan's power. Satan is the father of lies. Life eternal, according to Scripture, this is life eternal, that, you might, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ and thou hast sent. Eternal life equals knowing God. Then eternal death equals not knowing God. Does everybody get that? Satan's power of death, then, are the lies that he tells about God that we believe that keep us from knowing him. That's his power. Lies believe, break the circle of love and trust. Uh, Christ uh, revealed the truth, which destroys the lies and wins us back to trust. This is how he destroys Satan's power. Truth destroys lies, thus Satan is powerless over us when we know the truth. And then the third thing, he destroyed the infection of selfishness and cured the human condition. 
says in 2 Timothy 1.10, that Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So, question, what is the, how did Christ destroy death? What is the basis of life? God. Is God not the basis of life? Life emanates from God, flows out to all in unity with him who continue to live in harmony with his design. What happens if one decides to break God's law, God's design? What happens? One severs the connection with the source of life, and dying they die. So death is the natural outcome of selfishness. So sin is deviation from God's design law, and thus sin, not God, destroys the sinner. There's the scripture, Romans 6, 23, for sin pays its wage, which is death. Or James chapter 1, sin, when full grown, brings forth death. Or Galatians chapter 6, verse 8, the one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. Not from God. This is a hard saying of the Bible by University Press. It says, in rejecting God's structure and establishing our own, in violating God's intention for creation and substituting our own intentions, we cause our own disintegration. They get it. That's exactly right. And there's a historic quote from uh, Ellen White in First Elective Messages 235. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result. Every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character, and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result is ruin and death. See, this is design law. This is what Scripture teaches. This is what Ellen White teaches. This is what other people teach. So how did Jesus destroy death? In order to destroy death, Christ had to restore in humanity God's design law of love. Christ loved perfectly, refusing to act in self-interest to save self. And then we're going to put this together, three and four, because here's the fourth thing the Scripture says he did, and that is he destroyed the devil's work, 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And if you want to know what his work was, this is one author's thought, and the book lift him up. The life of Christ is to be revealed in humanity. Man was the crowning act of the creation of God. Man made in the image of God and designed to be the counterpart of God. But Satan has labored. What's another name for labored? Another word? Worked. Satan has worked to obliterate the image of God in man and to imprint upon him his own image. So Christ came to destroy the devil's work of effacing the image of God in man and making man like Satan in character and instead restoring God's image in man. That was part of his work. Everybody agree? So, putting it together, how, how, was it that, how was it that Jesus did this? And why did he have to die? Well, Jesus is, is a unique being. Maybe you hear sometimes theological arguments. Do you believe Jesus had a nature like Adam before the fall? Or do you believe Jesus had a nature like Adam after the fall? You ever hear that argument? Okay, pre-lapsarian, post-lapsarian. Um, the answer, if you want, in my view, is neither. He was unique, and I'll show it to you. Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a sinless being. Eve was taken from the side of a sinless being. She also came to life as a sinless being. You and I, we come from a sinful mother and a sinful father. We're conceived in sin, uh, born in iniquity. Did Jesus come in any of these ways? Did Jesus' humanity come from the dirt and, and a sinless being created out of dust? Did Jesus' humanity come from the side of a sinless being? Did Jesus have two sinful parents? Get your mind around it. When they say pre or post, it's false choice. He was neither. He was unique. He was born of a woman under law, but his father was the Holy Spirit. So in Jesus, Jesus had a humanity that was capable of being tempted in every way just like we are, but he had a mind that was capable of resisting and saying no to those temptations. That's because he came to cure the condition. That in the mind slash heart slash brain of Jesus Christ, the two antagonistic principles, other-centered love, God's design law, survival of the fittest, me first, selfishness, fought it out. And Jesus, as a human being, was tempted like us and chose to love perfectly. And thus Jesus restored God's design of love into the species human, reconnecting the human creation back to God's circle of love. 
So, Jesus, and notice, notice the temptations now. As soon as he's filled with the Holy Spirit, after his baptism, he's led by the Spirit out into the desert where he's tempted for 40 days. And notice the temptations. Turn the stone to bread, save yourself. Act in self-interest. That's the temptation. Jump down up here. Prove, prove yourself. Again, promote yourself, self-interest. Uh, bow down to me and worship me. Save yourself. Temptations are self-focused. Uh, he was tempted in every way, just like we are, yet without sin. And it says in James chapter 1, each one of us is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Are both of these true? Does that mean Jesus was tempted with human desire? Yes. Look at Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, did Jesus have powerful human emotions? What did the emotions tempt him to do? To save himself, to act in self-interest. That's right. But every time the temptation came, Jesus, instead of acting in self-interest, gave himself in love. No one can take my life from me. I will give it freely, an act of self-sacrifice. And on the cross, again, notice how Satan is assaulting him. He saved others, but, but can he, he can't save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. Or people stood watching, and the rulers sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ. You can see the temptation. Act in self-interest. Save self. Save self. But Jesus said, for everyone to save his life, will lose it. But he who loses my life will find it. You see, if you act in self-interest, you're acting out of harmony with the law of love. That's not the other-centered. Greater love is no man that he give his life for a friend. Jesus would have acted to perpetuate the infection that brings death. So when Jesus used, refused to use his power to save self, but instead gave himself freely, he destroyed death because he destroyed the survival drive that he assumed that was tempting him in Gethsemane. He destroyed it and restored in the perfect law of love. And so Ellen White wrote in Zara of Ages 46, the foe who in the wilderness had confronted Christ assailed him now with the fierce and subtle temptations. Had Jesus yielded for a moment, had he changed his course in the least particular to save himself, Satan's agencies would have triumphed and the world would have been lost. That was the core. That was the issue. So why did Jesus have to die? Because he, Adam infected humanity with a motive or drive that is out of harmony with how life is built. And without a new motive or drive, this is a terminal condition. And think about Christ on the cross. If at any point, as death is reaching for him, and he's sliding down towards death, if at any point he uses his power to stop death from taking him, who does he save? Self. The only way to destroy this drive to survive was not to give in to it and instead surrender in love perfectly. And this is what he was achieving. So Christ restored the law of love, the law of life, the law of love into humanity by giving himself freely. And this is why he rose again. See, when you understand design law, life becomes predictable. There, this, this, this will clear up some, con, some, peop, some text and, and, and Ellen White comments that seem to be contradictory, like where she says in one place, he could not see through the portals of the tomb. You know, you've read that, right? But in other places, we read Christ himself telling his apostles, I'm going to be betrayed into man's hands. I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise on the third day. How is he able to tell them he's going to rise on the third day if he can't see through the portals of the tomb? Right? How many can predict what will happen if I let go of this? I see two hands. Only two people can predict that. Okay? So, do you have the gift of prophecy? That's a future event. How can you predict what will happen in the future? Because you know the law of gravity. And when you know the law of gravity, you can make accurate predictions. Even without seeing through the portals of reality to see the future happening. He did not see in a prophetic way the future, yet he knew the law of love was the law of life, thus he could accurately tell his disciples, when I destroy the infection of selfishness and put my Father's law back in humanity, I'll rise again. And that's why it says the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving, bringing life to the soul. Hebrews 5, 9 and 10, it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of salvation for all who obey him. Wait a second. What do you mean once made perfect? 
Wasn't he always perfect? He was always sinless. But Bible perfection has to do with character development. He was always sinless. Let's be very clear about that. But the Bible perfection is about mature character. And character cannot be created. It had to be developed by Jesus Christ. He grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. He had to make choices as a human being to develop a perfect character. And once he developed the perfect character, ultimately, by his self-sacrifice of the cross, perfecting humanity, then he became the source of salvation for all who obey him. This is Desire of Ages 762. The law requires righteousness, a righteous life, a perfect character. Why? For the same reason the law of respiration requires that you breathe. That's why it requires it, because that's how life is built. The law requires righteousness, a righteous life, a perfect character. And this man has not to give. He cannot meet the claims of God's holy law. But Christ, coming to earth as a man, lived a holy life and developed a perfect character. Notice, developed a perfect character. This he offers as a free gift to all who will receive him. So why does the law require righteous character? For the same reason, the respiration. So how did Satan respond to this? He incited fear in the Roman and Jewish leadership, and they sought to persecute and eliminate Christians by killing and imprisoning them. How did God respond? He pours out his spirit to take what Christ has achieved now, perfect other-centered love, and he pours it into them, and they are able to love their persecutors. Stephen being stoned. Don't lay this to their account. You see the history of the martyrs in Rome, uh, loving others and singing hymns, which, by the way, Stephen's actions were convicting to Paul, of Saul, who became Paul. And then the martyrs we mentioned. So how did Satan respond to this? 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man of doom, doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. Notice now, this man of sin is going to set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. After Christ's death, after his resurrection, after his ascension, after, after the, the, uh, the, the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost, Satan counters with something that is going to set up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. The question is, what temple? This is the spirit temple. He did not go into heaven and not Jesus off his throne in heaven. How did this man of sin set himself up in the spirit temple, proclaiming himself to be God? By changing how we view God's law from design law to impose law. And once we view God's laws, impose law like ours, we view God as a, a dictator like Baal. And thus the temple becomes contaminated. God is presented as that dictator, cosmic executioner. And the world goes into an age of darkness, the dark ages. Bible scholars recognize this. I'm going to skip that quote. This is Eusebius, who is the first church historian, not world historian, church historian. Notice what he wrote. With the Roman Empire, monarchy had come on earth as the image of the monarchy in heaven. Do you understand what he's saying? God runs his universe like Caesar runs Rome. That's what the Christian church came to believe. How could they think that? Because they think God's law functions like human law. This is uh, the history of the Reformation by Tom, Tom Lindsay. This is the great men who built the Western church were almost all trained Roman lawyers. Tertullian, Cyprian, Augustine, Gregory the Great, whose writings from the bridge between the Latin fathers and the schoolmen were all men whose early training was that of a Roman lawyer. A training which molded and shaped their thinking, whether theological or ecclesiastical. They instinctively regarded all questions as a great Roman lawyer would. They had the lawyer's craving for exact definitions. They had the lawyer's idea that the primary duty laid upon them was to enforce obedience to authority. What method? Coercion. Whether that authority expresses itself in external institutions or in precise definitions of correct ways of thinking about truth. Let's have a, a 28 fundamentals and enforce those. No branch of Western Christendom has been able to free itself from the spell cast upon it by these Roman lawyers of the early centuries of Christian church. The, the spirit temple is infected with a legalistic, rules-oriented, human law, God construct. How did God respond to the infection of the spirit temple with this imperial law construct? Malachi 3, 1 through 3. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, he will come, says the Lord Almighty, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand? For he will be a refiner's fire, a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Notice what he purifies when he comes to his temple. He purifies the Levites and refines them as gold and silver. If you, I don't have time to build this whole case, but if you value Ellen White, she says in another place that this 
refers to the exact same event as Daniel 8.14. 2,300 days in the sanctuary will be cleansed. Malachi 3 refers to the exact same event. Do you understand that the 2,300-day the prophecy was about cleansing the temple and that and, and the temple is to be contaminated by the man of sin setting himself up in God's temple. And that event in cleansing the temple was going to cleanse the Levites. That's what's being cleansed because the minds, the spirit temple, has been contaminated. So who are the Levites? You, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. The Levites are the priesthood of believers. And so according to Scripture, what is the heavenly sanctuary constructed out of? And people ask me, I, somebody in here, if I don't preempt this right now, is going to come up to me afterwards and say, do you believe in a literal temple in heaven? Yes, I do. Question to you. If you use only inspired sources, what are the building materials of the temple in heaven? What is that literal, physical temple built from? Ephesians 2. There's only one. There's many more. I don't have time to give them all. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Is this sanctuary that's described in this text built by human hands or not by human hands? This is a temple not built by human hands. Why cleanse the Levites? Because the Levites are the living stones. Remember this, Peter? You are living stones built together. In living stones from which the heavenly temple is constructed. And I'm about wrapping up now. This is a quote from Ellen White, who was one of the authors of the entire sanctuary message. And notice what she says. The first tabernacle built according to God's direction was indeed blessed of him. The people were thus preparing themselves to worship in the temple not made with hands, a temple in the heavens. The stones of the temple built by Solomon were all prepared at the quarry and brought to the temple site. They came together without the sound of axe or hammer. The timbers were also fitted in the forest. The furniture likewise brought to the house, all prepared for use. Even so, the mighty cleaver of truth has taken out a people from the quarry of the world and is fitting this people who profess to be the children of God for a place in his heavenly temple. We want the cleaver of truth to do its work for us. We are taken from the quarry of the world. The material must not be a dead substance, but living souls. And these souls must be brought out of the quarry of the world where the hand of God can fit them for the temple in heaven. We are here as probationers, and we must pass under the hand of God. All rough edges and rough surfaces must be removed. We must be stones fitted for the building. We are brought into church capacity with defects of character, but we must not retain them. We must be fitted and squared for the building. We must be laborers together with God, for we are God's husbandry. We are God's building. In view of this, we must see that our temple is not defiled with sin. We should be lively stones, not dead ones, but live ones that will reflect the image of Christ. Does that blow your mind away? Do you understand that the heavenly sanctuary message that we have been taught has been taught through an imposed law construct? Thus it becomes a legal actions of books and records and a building in heaven with smoke and mirrors and who knows what else. It's never, that was all metaphor. That's metaphor. There is a reality to God's universe. And the reality is that you are a living being created in the image of God to be a dwelling place where he dwells by his spirit. And together, collectively, we become the heavenly sanctuary. If you want some more text for that, read the church, read in Revelation to one of the churches where it says that the, the righteous says this about them. You will be a pillar in the temple of your God and never will you leave it. You mean we're going to be imprisoned in a building for all eternity? When it, You get that? Or how about the end of the Psalms, the 23rd Psalms? What does it say at the very end of the 23rd Psalms? Thus we will dwell in the house of the Lord. I'm going to be imprisoned in that building for all eternity? No. You are the construction material. You will always be, no matter where you are in the universe, part of the temple. From what would the minds of God's people be cleansed? From the lies about God. This is Paul saying to the people about God. God may be found true, though every man be a liar, as it is written, that, thou, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. See, Satan's lied about God. He started in the beginning. And it's going to come back around. And God's waiting for a people who can tell the truth about him so we can reject the lies. God, looking through the corridors of time in Daniel chapter 8, says... 
It's going to be 2,300 years before enough truth is recovered that people can reject the lies about me and the sanctuary be cleansed. Revelation 14, 7. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea. Those who view the imposed law construct, that view it through those lenses, they say, be afraid of God and you better obey his rules and you better keep the right day because the hour is coming when he's going to investigate your deeds and he's going to hold you accountable. And if you're not worshiping on the right day, you're going to get punished by that righteous judge. Design law says, be in awe, be overwhelmed with the beauty of God and his character. Reveal his character, give him glory, reveal his character and how you live. For the time has come in human history for the people to make a right judgment about God. To throw off the lies and come back to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. To worship our designer and creator and stop worshiping this Baal, distorted, dictator, grotesque image that has gone to the world. The war began in heaven over God's character and law of love, and it will end over the same issue. Thank you. thank you so much for all that you have done through Christ to reach us. Lord, the lies have been so deep and so long, but the truth is more powerful. We ask that your spirit of truth and love will be poured into our hearts and minds. Help us to put the pieces together. Enable us at this time in human history to be your spokespersons, to take the message of your kingdom of love, your character of love, your methods of love to the world, that the world will be lightened and you might come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen. So we're supposed to start back at two, yeah? It's quarter to one. Are we going to start back at two or should we postpone that by 15 minutes? Do you think you can be back by two?
eat and everything? So, so we'll, come back at, we'll come back as close to two as we can. We'll try. All right, thanks.